Providing Faith Christian Center Sunday morning service. Praise God. Located 3237G uh, Beecher Road in Flint, Michigan. That's 48532. Come on down. Our service is started right now. And you know our regular service. You can look up online and see the regular service up on that. Praise God. And so we just got through praying, which you heard all that static. My head bowed. We're praying. So now we're about ready to make our confessions with a Bible that raised up in the air. So if you're at home, you got your tablets, your phones, your iPads, however you access the Bible, raise it up. Make this confession with us here so that you can release your faith with the words of your mouth to receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Amen. I apologize for that. Praise God. But hey, hey we all make mistakes. Amen. All right. Say with me right now. Say this is my Bible. This say it with, with enthusiasm. Say this is my Bible. It is God's word that tells me that my faith is only limited by the word inside of me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Today I will hear his word. I will believe his word and I will act upon his word. Therefore, through my faith, I will pursue, I will overcome and I'll recover all that the devil stole from me. Today, my life shall never be the same because of God's words, of God's words. In, Jesus name, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, praise God. I believe that you meant that from your hearts because you said it with your mouth, and therefore it shall come to pass. Hallelujah. Last week we were in the area uh, where we've been teaching, praise God, transforming our lives to the image of God. We found out from our foundational scripture in the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, verse number 29, where the Bible says, For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, his means of God, his son, so that he, God's son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we see that it is the will of God for every one of us who have become born again into the body of Christ that it is God's will for us to be conformed. Say conform. Conform means to bring into harmony or accord or to make of like form with another person or thing to be similar or identical to, identical to be in agreement or harmony or to be obedient or compliant or to act in accordance with prevailing standards or customs. Boy, that's a whole lot of a whole lot of that conformity, isn't that true? Amen. God wants us to be conformed to the image of his son, that he the son might be the firstborn. So we shared a number of scriptures that substantiated this and showed us how to do this. And so we're still showing how to be transformed uh, into the image of God's son. And we talked about last week about our confession brings forth that transformation into the image of God's son so that we can be like Christ and not like Mike. Amen. Praise God. He said, what are you talking about, Pastor? You like Michael Jordan and, you know, yeah, we'll forget it, okay? Amen. But he wants us to be transformed into the image of the Son. We saw in Romans 10, chapter, verses 9 and 10, we read in this particular verse of Scripture where the Apostle Paul was writing, and we use this particular verse of Scripture for our salvation message so that people who are not born again can become born again. Because we found out that Christianity is known as the great confession. Let me say that again. Christianity is known as the great confession. In order to get into uh, becoming a Christian, it is with the confession of your mouth that you believe in your heart. We found that from Romans 10, chapter, verses 9 and 10. In verses 9 and 10, if you turn with me in your Bibles there, we can see it in the scriptures so that you know that I'm teaching you out of the Bible and what the Bible says and not my opinion and what I think and what I feel. Because that's so vitally important. Men's opinions is man's opinion. But God's word is God's truth. Amen. God is the one that determines how he wants us to do things in his kingdom. And that's why he said in Matthew, the sixth chapter, Jesus said, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you have need of in this life shall be added unto you. So to seek ye first the kingdom of God is to seek his, his righteousness is doing things the way that God wants things to be done. And we found that out from Matthew, the third chapter, when Jesus left Galilee 
to go to John the Baptist and John the Baptist says, whoa, Jesus, you come to me for me to baptize you. And Jesus says, allow it to be so now so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. And when he had did done this, he went down the water, came up out of the water and the voice of God spoke and said, this is my beloved son of whom I'm well pleased because he did things the way that I wanted things to be done. So we know that's what righteousness is. So praise God, that's what we're doing. We're walking in righteousness. We're reading the book of righteousness. Praise God, we're awakening unto righteousness. Amen. We're following the instructions in righteousness. Amen. Amen. So have you found Romans the 10th chapter? After all that talking, I know you found it by now. <laughs> Woo, you can tell I'm some kind of excited because I am because I'm thinking about how we left off last week, boy. All right, in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, and he shows how Christianity is known as the great confession because it is through our confession of what we believe in our heart that got us into the kingdom of God in the first place. And it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then verse number 10. Let's read that together, please. Those of you here, those of you on Facebook Live, those of you on YouTube and Twitter in the near future, please read out loud with us right now because God is speaking to you now just like he's speaking to us now, even though you're reading and listening to this and looking at this in the future because God dwells in one eternal now. Amen. Woo, that's the omnipotence of God. All right, let's read together. Ready, go. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. <clears throat> so what you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth is what brings you salvation, what brings you into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> when Jesus says in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said in John 3, 5, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is done through the confession of our mouth of what we believe in our heart about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because Jesus was the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. He was the Lamb of God who was crucified on the cross. Now in the Levitical priesthood, which is a type and shadow of what was to come, they took the lamb and cut his throat and took a blood and let it pour it into a basis and took it into the Holy Holies by the great high priest alone. And he poured it across the mercy seat for their forgiveness of sins. Jesus being our high priest, his own blood after he was crucified, when that blood came out of him through the sword that was thrust, the spear that was thrust to his side and came out blood and water, that blood he took up into the Holy of Holies into heaven and laid it across the Holy of Holies in heaven for eternal remission, eternal forgiveness of our sins so that we might become born again. Can you say amen to that? Man, if that don't bless you, I don't know what would bless you. I'm so thankful that I have eternal salvation through Jesus Christ my Lord, and you do too. So he says, for with a man's heart he believes this unto righteousness, and with his mouth confession is made unto salvation. So Christianity is, the great a great, is known as the great confession. We saw from the book of Philemon, or Philemon, I just jokingly say Philemon, in verse chapter 1, verse number 6, that the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration, writes this, this in the scriptures. And remember, as I said before, it bears repetition. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instructions in righteousness. That in the book of Philemon, it says that the communication of thy faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So we found out that it is the communication of our faith is something that communication is done by words. Remember we saw that before? Communication is done by words. Now somebody said, what about uh, people that can't speak? Well, they use sign language. And sign language com com um, uh, conveys words. These symbols and these signs are to create words. And words are somatic in meaning. In other words, words that are put together, they convey ideas, thoughts, and images. And so communication is based upon the somatics of words put together to convey ideas, thoughts, and images. Praise God. So the communication of your faith, the words that come out of your mouth, the words of faith, the communication of that faith may become effectual or effective by the acknowledging of every good thing 
which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, it says in you because when you became born again, everything that pertains to life and godliness was, de impart was, was departed or imparted on the inside of you. God has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places that is in Christ Jesus. He's not going to. He's already done it. So everything that you have need of to live a successful, abundant life, because remember Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Everything that you need that pertains to life and God-likeness, and I have to emphasize that because it's according to a godly lifestyle, is parted under into you. It's been provided for you since the new birth. So he says the communication of your faith becomes effective by you acknowledging of the good things, the abundant life that is in you, that is in Christ Jesus, because Jesus is the one that came to bring it. And when he bought it, he bought it, and we became one with Christ, and we became heirs of God, and we became joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Remember that, Romans the 8th chapter, that you are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And what belongs to God belongs to you, and what belongs to Christ belongs to you. That's what an heir is. An heir is someone who inherited something to the person that left what was theirs over to you. And Jesus, he died because the inheritance can, can never become effective or can never be activated without the death of the, um, the, the uh, maker of the inheritance. Amen? I would say testator. The Bible calls it the testators. And that just means the covenant maker, praise God, the covenant, which is when you are left uh, heir of somebody's possessions, then you receive a covenant contract. That covenant contract is made out saying you are now to become the possessor of that which I own. The only difference is that Jesus is still alive. He ain't dead. So he enforces, he enforces the covenant that he made with us. Amen? Isn't that good? Praise God. And so the communication of your faith by the acknowledgement of the good things which is in you that is in Christ Jesus is necessary for us to continuously confess during one's duration of life here on the earth. Because it's on the earth that God wants us to enjoy the abundant life. He says, I come that you might have life, eternal life. And then he says, and life more abundantly, which is to be enjoyed on the earth. Because there's nothing but abundance in heaven. There's nothing that steals, kills, and destroys in heaven. There is no battle to be fought in heaven. It's only down here on the earth. And so that abundant life that God wants you to enjoy is why you're here on the earth. So that you can be a witness of the goodness of your heavenly father. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. Amen. And then we talked about in 2 Corinthians, we shared in verse, chapter 4, verse 13, where it says, We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. What do you mean having the same spirit of faith? Well, the Bible says in the book of Romans that God has dealt unto every man the measure of faith. You remember that? Let me turn, let me turn with you into the Bible over there so I can show you in the Bible. I didn't mention it last week, but I'm going to mention it. I mention it today. <laughs> ah, glory be to God. You say, Pastor, you seem like you're excited. I am. I'm excited about the word. Okay, so where are we going? We're going over here, praise God, where God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. In the book of Romans, Romans, okay, let me find that. Where's that Romans? Romans 14. Uh, well, God has dealt unto every man the measure of faith. Where are we at? Um, that is Romans, this 12th chapter, and verse number 3. Romans 12, 3. Romans 12, 3. Now notice what it says right here. He says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man, every woman that is among you in the body of Christ, not to think of him or herself more highly than he or she ought to think, but to think soberly, 
according, say according, according, according as God has dealt to every man and woman in the body of Christ, the measure of faith. Say the measure of faith. The measure of faith. When you became born again, you received the measure of faith. You say, well, how did that happen, Pastor? Well, when you received the gospel. Remember the Bible says, <clears throat> it says in the scriptures, how shall they call upon him of whom they have not heard or believe, and how shall they believe except they hear, and how shall they hear except someone be sent? Romans the 10th chapter, verses 14 and verse 15. Remember that? How shall they call upon him of whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear except someone be sent? So, when you became born again, you received the same measure of faith. You receive what? The same measure of faith. Now we go back to the book of 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, and verse number 23. <clears throat> uh, verse number 23. Excuse me, verse number 13, not 23. And if, uh, it says here, we having the same spirit of faith. So where did that spirit of faith come from? It came as a result of when you became born again, when you heard the gospel, excuse me, when you heard the gospel of salvation, you receive the measure of faith so that you can become born again. Amen. Now let me say this statement here so you can hear me. Faith grows. Say faith grows. faith grows. How does faith grow? Faith grows from hearing, believing, and acting on the word of God. Amen. You don't grow in faith unless you act upon the word. And there are going to be circumstances and situations in your life that are going to require for you to act upon the word of God. At any given time, there will be situations that you're going to have to act upon the word of God. I'm always acting upon the word of God in my life when I say always when situation arises. I get attacked in my body just like you get attacked in your body. I was attacked in my body a couple of months ago and uh, I had to believe God for the healing of my body. Had some situation that was going on inside of my body, and I had to confess the word. Never told anybody about it because I didn't have to because I talked to God about it, and I claimed my healing based on the word. And now that problem I had in my body is there no more. Amen. Now there's still some attack that's on my body, but I've noticed that that attack is is fading away because He said, "What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. You shall have them." So the shall have them is God's responsibility, but to believe in that I receive them when I pray is my responsibility. And if I believe I receive it when I pray, then every day I wake up and I say, Father, I thank you for the healing of my physical body. I thank you for the healing of this condition in my body. I thank you for the healing of it. I thank you that this, this situation in my body is gone away. I'm healed of it. I thank you because by his stripes I were healed. If I were, I am. I thank you, Lord, that I'm healed. Thank you, Lord, that I'm healed. When my body, my pain goes to my body, when that pain, <coughs> I feel that pain in my body, I don't deny the pain because the pain is real. And the Bible never tells us not to deny that which is real. No, the Bible tells us not to look at those things. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. It says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, that word seen means perceived by the senses. And I perceived in my body pain when it hit my body. So I couldn't say, I'm not in no pain. I'm healed. I don't feel no pain, but I'm healed. No, that's Christian science tells you to do something like that, and it has nothing to do with the Bible. The Bible says we call it those things that be not as though they were. The Bible says we having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. We also believe and therefore we speak. Speak what? We speak what God speaks. God speaks, calls things that be not as though they were. The book of Romans, when he talked to Abraham, in Romans 4, chapter, verse 17, it says, God who calleth those things that be not as though they were. He says, I have made thee the father of many nations when he spoke to Abraham according to that which he promised. And the Bible says Abraham believed God and did not consider his own body being dead in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham says, I'm not going to look at the things which are perceived by my senses, but I'm going to look to what God spoke to me. And God says, he has made me the father of many nations. I don't have a child. I'm old. I'm 90-something years old. 
And Sarah's womb, her belly, is past the child-rearing years. But I'm not going to let that be the, con be the conditions on whether or not the promise of God that was given to me is going to come, pass, come to pass or not. So the Bible says he was fully persuaded that what God has said, he was well able to perform. And he did it. He had a child. She had a child. Because she counted God faithful, who had promised. So her faith was there too. So this is what he's talking about. It says Abraham, who staggered not at the promise of God, but was, was strong in faith. And it says the strong faith, the reason why he was strong in faith, because he kept giving glory unto God. Every day he gave glory to God. Every time he called out his name, Abraham, father of many nations. Every time he called Sarah, 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 Sarai, which God changed her name to Sarah, which means mother of many nations. Every time he called out and said, Sarah, he was saying, mother of many nations. He was calling things that be not as though they were. He had the same, he had a spirit of faith, which he received from God. So, here the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4.13. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. That spirit of faith came as a result of us getting born again. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number, what verse did I say it was, was in? Verse number 3. He says, according as God has dealt to every man, say every man. Every man. Now, I have some edge of vocation whether you know it or not. But my understanding, every man, and man meaning mankind, male and female, means all of us. Amen. Is that true or not true? true? It's absolutely true. I mean, I have that much, you know, edge and vocation to understand that, that every means every. God has dealt unto every man, every woman, listen, who hears and believes. Because he said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thy heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, he or she shall be saved. So the believing is necessary, even though he has already gave unto every man the measure of faith, that is, he, he had the apostles. He had the apostles. Last week we talked about in Thursday night Bible study that we are, we, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the chief cornerstone being Jesus Christ. It was their testimony that they said to someone else and then someone else told someone else and someone else told someone else and someone else told someone else. And someone else told someone else, and it passed on down to the present generation that people are still preaching the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as a result, they hearing, they believing, they get saved. Amen? Amen. So we see from the scriptures that when, we are, when the gospel is preached unto us, we hear it and we believe it. And when we hear it, we receive the measure of faith to get born again. For by grace are you saved through faith. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 8. Say, for by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is hearing, believing, and acting on the word of God. So the measure of faith that you receive came through the hearing of the word. So now we having the same spirit of faith. We who? The Christian. Every one of us. You, me, and the first person who has just been born again a few seconds ago. You say, who was that, Pastor? I don't know. I ain't God. But I guarantee you somebody just got born again a second ago. Because somebody's out there preaching the gospel. A whole lot of us. Amen? Amen? And so that very person that got born again just a very second ago, that person just received the same measure of faith. Now that they received the measure of faith, they now have the same spirit of faith. And with that serious spirit, spirit of faith, then they must cooperate because Christianity is known as the great confession. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it's written, I have believed, therefore I speak. I have believed, therefore I speak. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, 
and shall believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. If you do not believe in your heart, if you do not confess with your mouth, you won't be saved. If you believe in your heart and don't confess with your mouth, you won't be saved. But I believe in God too. Great. That's wonderful. That's the beginning. But you got to complete that. What do you mean? You got to confess with your mouth. Well, I just don't believe that. I, I just want you to know that, you know, I, I have God in my heart and I believe, I believe in God. Well, no, the Bible didn't say that. The instruction book doesn't say that. It says if thou, thou should, con if thou should confess with th thou should believe in the heart and confess with thy mouth, you shall be saved. So you'll never get saved without the confession of your mouth, what you believe in your heart. We have in the same spirit of faith, we believe, and therefore we speak. So, we found out in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, we were reading from the verse number 1 to verse number 54. And we were showing, that, showing you that the Old Testament reveals the same principle that is in today's new covenant. That you must believe in your heart and confess with your mouth to release the power of God on your life on the earth today. Because it's when you confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart that you release the power of God for your salvation. Your salvation, you being born again, Jesus says, except that man be born of the Spirit of God, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Remember that? John 3, 5. Now he says, except a man be born of water, that is to exist first, and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, to be birthed into the earth, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you have to exist before you can get born again. Isn't that true? So, as a result, the, um, trying to figure out how it got, got to that one. Christianity is known as the great confession so that we can enter into the kingdom of God. But that principle of the believing in the heart and the confession of the mouth happened way back in the Old Testament. Now we mentioned Abraham doing it. Let's look at another guy in the scriptures. He's not the only one. But go with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. Man, I'm telling you, I'm just becoming unglued inside. See, I'm hearing myself speak by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because I prayed that prayer that God would give me utterance, and he's doing that now. I'm saying things today that I didn't say last week. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, turn with me in your Bibles. Ooh, I tell you what, God's truth is always consistent. It's this, there's no discombobulation of God's word at all. Ooh, glory be to God. In the book of 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, for the sake of those of you that were not here last Sunday, you can go back and listen to the broadcast, and we went and we read scriptures, and we got all the way down to verse number... <clears throat> we got down to verse number 26. Actually, we passed it, but we're going to start at verse number 26. How David, who was a son of Jesse... He had a number of brothers. I forget the number of brothers in the Bible, but it doesn't matter because we're not really talking about that. And I don't think it's of any... First Samuel chapter 17. Yes, First Samuel 17. And we're going we're gonna to start at verse number 26. We read verse number 1 all the way to verse number 25. And I think we read 26. But I'm going to start there so that we can go ahead and progress where we left off last week. Again, you got to listen to the message from last week. It's out there on Facebook Live. Uh, praise God. And, uh, out on Facebook, praise God. We have it on the video. Amen. Uh, also, praise God. So, 1 Samuel chapter 17. So, David was the youngest son of Jesse, who had a number of other sons. Three of the sons had went to join the army with Saul, who was the king of Israel. They were in the battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines had a champion among their military force. His name was Goliath. This man, Goliath, was nine foot tall. Big, huge fella. In fact, he was so tall that he had someone else that bore his shield. And he had someone else that carried his 
his, his uh, spear. Now he carried his sword and what have you and uh, had his helmet and his brass on and his shoulder protection, all of his armor on. And uh, he stood before the children of Israel, and he defied the children of Israel. And one of the things we notice that this uh, Goliath was that he spoke words to the children of Israel about what he was going to do, or what his stance was towards the children of Israel, if I can say it that way. Let's look at verse number, uh, oh, let's see verse 15. Uh, uh, verse number 6 uh, to 8. In verse number 6 and 8 it says, and he had, oh, that's for verse 5. And it talks about, no, verse 4. He says, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubit in a span. He had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of maul, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, meaning it was very heavy. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs. In other words, he had armor on his legs. And he targeted the brass between his shoulders. That means he had armor between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Meaning it's very heavy, that's all. And one, of the, one bear and his shield went before him, somebody that carried his shield. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. So we see that uh, Goliath carried his own spear, not the man. He just carried the shield. So I'll correct myself on that. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them. Now notice this. This is what you pick up on. That Goliath spoke words to the armies of Israel. Words are somatic in meanings. They convey uh, image, ideas, ideas, images, and thoughts. Ideas, images, and thoughts. Words. That's what they convey. Convey. Amen? So, he says in verse 8, and look at verse 8, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said, he did what? He said, you say with your mouth. He said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? And not, am not I a Philistine, and if you Philistine, and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and can to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And then those verse 8, 10. And the Philistine said, I, say I. I. That means he's talking about himself. He says, I defy. Now notice he's, he describes who he de he's defying. <coughs> he says, I defy the armies of Israel. This day give me a man that we might fight together. And when Saul and all Israel did what? Heard those words. Heard those words. Look at that verse of scripture. When he heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They got afraid of words. Have you ever been afraid of words that were spoken to you? Have you ever had the big bully in the school that spoke words to you while you were standing by your locker and you was opening up your locker to get your books out so you can go to your next period of class? And that big bully came over to you. I'm going to beat you to a boat, pope after class, after school. I'm going to catch you and I'm going to beat your brains out. And you living there listening. You listen to these words. And you look up and this big old belly rascal's talking this stuff to you. And man, all of a sudden your heart start beating faster than it was before you started to your locker. Boom, 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 boom. And while you're walking with your books, you in the days now. You are so amazed. You're so afraid because, you know, while you're sitting in class, the teacher's teaching and you're looking at the clock. You're looking at the clock because when three o'clock comes around, you know the bully told you with words. Say words. words. Say words. words. The bully told me, he said, he's going to beat me to a pope. And your imagination and your mind and your thoughts and your images are just going forth in your mind. And you're seeing yourself down there in a pulse laying on the ground. Just your nose all beat in, blood cushing out of your lips and everything. Well, this guy is standing over you. And you're afraid. You don't hear what the teacher is saying because you're afraid of the words that he spoke out of his mouth. This is what happened to the children of Israel. 
Are you listening? Or are you going home in the corner of your mind? Words. Say words. words. We're talking about that Christianity is known as a great confession. That your confession brings the transformation of you into the image of Christ. It also brings you into possession of what Christ has already provided through to, for you through the redemptive work that he did on the cross. It's your confession with your mouth. And that's what we're trying to teach you through the scriptures, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, bring you into the knowledge of the whole picture of the truth of God's word so that you can be an overcomer in this life, not in the sweet by and by, ain't nothing to overcome when you get up there in heaven. Can you say amen? amen. It's on the earth that you're going through your troubles, your tests and trials. That's where you're getting it at. So now let's go back to the scriptures. You've got to look at these scriptures because they point out some truth in these scriptures. Now what verse was I in? What, what, what verse was, was I at? Verse what? Verse 11. See? That young teenager in the back, see, they, they, be, they be listening, boy. Now it says in verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid, like that, little, that bully told me in, when I was standing by my locker. <laughs> and, and, and all kind of, Yeah, the bully told me he going to beat me up to a pole after school. I remember that, Edison Junior High School. Shoot, you think I wasn't afraid? And then verse number, uh, verse number 12 said, Now David was the son of that Eph Ephrath of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons, he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. So we're going to skip on down there because we talked about that last week. And let's drop all the way down. And we want to go to verse number 26. And very David spoke to the men. Or oh, we start verse number 25. And the men of Israel said, <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the verse number 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. Look at verse 25. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Now listen to what these men of Israel said. Now I'm saying this on purpose. Listen to what the men of Israel said. Say said. Say it. They communicated with their mouths. They communicated with their mouths. They said words out of their mouths. They conveyed images, thoughts, and ideas. Are you listening? And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely, now look at what they said. To defy who? Israel. Israel. To defy who? Israel. Israel. Now you say, well, why are you making a point about that, Pastor? You're going to see it in a moment. To defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, <coughs> the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. In other words, the king of Israel, Saul, was trying to put carriage in the heart of someone to go out and fight against this Philistine by giving him some things. Some people use drugs, alcohol, to try to get carriage to face the adversities of life. They try to go and get, you know, I mean, there's good, what they call, um, they call motivational talk and speeches, which is not bad within itself, but if that's all you depended upon as a Christian, there's some things that's going to come to you, come against you, spiritually by the devil, that that motivational speaking, it ain't going to help you at all. Motivational speaking is not going to help you when it comes <laughs> to attacking your body of cancer and tuberculosis and <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis and COVID-19 and monkeypox and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to need more than just motivational speaking. So you better, you don't have to know that. Amen? Amen. Now, listen what he says. In verse number 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel. Now notice David's words. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now what is David saying when he says uncircumcised Philistine? Listen to pastor. Look up at me now. The uncircumcised were those who did not have a covenant with the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. David and all the children of Israel, Saul and every one of them, 
God had made a covenant with Abraham that he would be their most high God, that if they would keep his word and obey him, that he would keep them from all of their enemies. And anyone that came against them, God would step up and he would fight their battles. Yes, hallelujah. It's kind of like having a, it's kind of like having a big brother when you're going to school. <laughs> if I had a big brother that was going to school when I was in school, when that bully came up to me while I was at my locker trying to open it up so I can get my books to go to my next class, and he told me he was going to beat me to a pulp, I'd have said, well, psh, I'm going to get my big brother. But I didn't have no big brother. I just had me. <laughs> and the brother I had, he was older than I was, but he wasn't the big brother that I needed. Amen? So I had few for, few for myself, and I, I began to get a little reputation. But my point is, Jesus is our big brother. Can you say amen? amen. Well, he says this uncircumcised Philistine because the children of Israel had a covenant with God. And everyone that was not a Jew was, concern, was, was, was considered or called by the Jews the uncircumcised. Now the uncircumcised terminology came as a reason when God told Moses to circumcise or told Abraham to circumcise the firstborn. The firstborn child, the child, the male child that came to they were circumcised. They, all the males were circumcised. It was a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham, God and the Jews, that was practiced on down during the time of the Old Testament covenant until Jesus came. The circumcision that we go through today is the circumcision of our hearts, our spirits, when we're made new creatures in Christ Jesus. Now we're in the kingdom of God. And we're heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. You see that? Amen? Amen. So, go back in verse 26. So David says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the... Listen, look what his word says. That he should defy the what? Read, read the rest of that. He should defy the what? The armies of the... The armies of the what? God. Now notice what he said. He didn't say that he should defy the armies of Israel. No, he said that he should defy the armies of the living God. Words. Words, confession, the communication of your faith becomes effectual, effective by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. Words out of your mouth that you believe in your heart. David believed those words and he spoke it with his mouth. He said that Goliath came and that Goliath, the uncircumcised Philistine, was defying the armies of the living God. It was God's army. God was in command. Oh my God, that is so much different from what the men of Israel said. They said he came to defy the armies of Israel. David said he come to defy the armies of the living God. God, totally different, totally different, totally different. And the Bible, the Bible tells us that the confession of our faith is supposed to be totally different from what the world says. Amen. I'm not an old sinner saved by grace. I'm not trying to make heaven my home. I'm not trying to overcome. Right, amen. I'm not trying to be strong. I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might. My name is written in the land book of life. Hallelujah. I have eternal life. Yes. I have been born again. I can do all things through Jesus Christ that strengthens me. That's my confession of faith. And I'm telling you, it causes me to stand tall, strong. Hallelujah. I was in the store the other day. <clears throat> I was in there in Walmart, and I was going down the aisle to pick up an item. As I was in the store, I heard this guy, and he was in the row, big, husky fellow, 
had a lady behind him on a wheelchair, in a wheelchair, and he was just cussing, I mean, blanket it, blank, 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 and I'm standing there, he's here, and I'm here, and I'm hearing these words. And all of a sudden, what rose up inside of me is I reached down and grabbed my item, and I said real loud, Praise the Lord! Thank you, Jesus! Hallelujah! Praise God! Amen! And he stopped and he looked and he said, Amen, Amen. And the lady in which she said, Yeah, yeah, Amen, Amen. And he stopped the cursing. How was I able to do that? Because greater is he that is in me than that spirit that was causing him to curse out loud standing next to me. Christians go to go places and they just put up with things. I heard Pastor Philip Godot Jr. teach one day. He says, as Christians, full of the Holy Ghost and full of the power of God, when they walk into, a, into an environment, he said they should change the environment. Yes. But you can't do that when you don't make a confession, your communication, your faith, faith is not there. You can't do that when you're not confessing who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ, what you can do to Christ. You can't do that when you don't pray in tongues and build up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You Christianity, Christianity is known as the great confession. Say with your mouth what you believe in your heart. Greater is he that is in me than he who was in him that's in this world. Because the world, the Bible says Satan is the god of this world. And the sinner is part of the world, controlled by the God of this world. They didn't choose to do it. We know that. But nevertheless, it doesn't change the fact that they are children of the wicked one, the children of darkness. But you're a child of light. What fellowship has light with darkness? What, what fellowship has Belial with Christ? You are the body of Christ. They are the body of Satan. Now we're not, we're not speaking evil to people. We're calling things, calling things that are. It exists. They can only change who they are when they become born again. And the way they get become born again is that they must believe in their heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead who was a Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And was crucified on the cross. And died and was buried. And on the third day he was raised from the dead. So that they could be saved. And they can believe that in their heart that they hear. And they can confess with their mouth and they'll become saved. This is as easy as taking candy from a baby. Your confession brings a transformation of you coming into the image of Christ. Can you say amen? amen? Let's finish this. Let's finish this. Oh man, I'm telling you. Ooh, praise the Lord. It says in verse number 27, and the people answered him after this manner. Verse 27. <clears throat> so you got to follow me. You got to follow these scriptures because the scriptures were written for our affirmation and for our learning. Those things that were written beforehand. And the people answered him after this matter, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, David's eldest brother, heard when David spoke unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou down here? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know you, your pride, your prideful, arrogant thing, and the naughtiness of your heart. You, you, you just have some wrong intentions trying to be all bold like you are. And then uh, for, thou come, for thou art come down that you might see the battle. That's all you come here for so you can see what the battle is. You just come down here being nosy. You know the devil will do the same thing you do now? He'll do that to you through other people. He, he, who do you think he is? Always speaking about faith and always talking, you know, he can do all things with Christ. Who do you think he is? Who, you think you're better than somebody else? No, I'm just, 
I'm just letting the communication of my faith become effective by me acknowledging every good thing that is in me that is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Jesus came that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus died and was crucified, was died and went to hell and was raised again the third day that I might be free, be set free from the powers of darkness. The Bible says, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the wicked one, Satan. And every wicked word comes from Satan. And he came that he might break over the power of Satan over my life. I'm just taking what Jesus provided for me. Amen. So how is that being arrogant? Right. Prideful. How is that being arrogant and prideful? Well, all I'm doing is receiving what Jesus, oh, thank you, Jesus, what Jesus did for ye, me and did for you. Amen. And I'm not going to let no man, no woman intimidate me because they're there murmuring and backbiting and talking about me. <coughs> have, I, have I arrived to perfection? I'll be the first one to tell you no. But there's one thing I know. I'm pressing on the onward way and new heights I'm gaining every day. Hallelujah. The prayer that I pray as I'm onward bound, dear Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Because higher ground is where I choose to, I choose to be. And it's going to come to pass because of what I believe. Amen. I believe God's word. And I'm letting the communication of my faith become effective so that I can be partakers of everything that pertains to life and godliness. For my life. Now I can do it for me. But I can't do it for you. I can pray for you. That God would open up the eyes of your understanding. I can pray for you. That God give you repentance. So that you would acknowledge the truth. That you've heard. And that you know. And begin to walk in the light of it. So that you with your communication of your faith. Might become partakers of the divine nature. That's on the inside of you. And been provided for you through Jesus Christ already. So you can too. Also. Rise above. The adversities, the circumstances, and tests and trials of this life. Is it easy? Not on the flesh. Because the flesh just want to, you know, oh Lord, oh Lord, do something, Lord. Oh Lord, do, Lord, take it away. Oh Lord, oh, oh Lord, rebuke the devil. God said, no. He said, you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Yes. The Lord said, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on the blessings of eternal life. You can't go to the Lord and do it. He's done everything that needs to be done for you to enjoy the abundant life. If he hadn't done it, then praise God, he, then the Bible is a farce. Jesus, when he says, he says, in this world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. How am I have good cheer just because you overcome the world and I can't do anything about it while I'm in this world and the world is coming against me? How am I, how am I be able to keep up to all cheer? By doing what he says. There is no temptation taken to such as common unto man. But God will not allow you to be temp tempted above that you're able. But will with the temptation, test, and trial make a way of escape. What's the way of escape? Fight the good fight of faith. Walk by faith. Let the communication of your faith become effectual by the acknowledgement of good, every good thing that's in you that's in Christ Jesus. We have in the same spirit of faith. We believe and therefore we speak. We also believe and therefore we speak. I have to do what the Bible says. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea. Mark eleven twenty three, 23. And shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass. He'll have whatsoever he saith. You're going to have to do something about it. I'm just waiting for my change to come. I'm just waiting for my change to come. Oh, one day I'm going to enjoy the way over there. I'm just waiting for my chains to come. You be waiting, boy, and the devil be beating all upside your head, and then you're going to get over there. And when you get there, God's going to ask you this question. He says, why didn't you do what my word says to do? Amen. He says, I, I, when I ascended, I said, all power, all authority has been given unto me, both in heaven and earth. Now you go. I delegate that power and authority to you. Why didn't you do something with it? That's what he's going to say. Oh yeah, it's hard. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. We want to get down to this. What was my time? So I got to win. I'm over? 
Oh my God. See, that's why, see my second Holy Ghost, my, my loving wife, I'm surprised she ain't texting, say. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Listen, listen. I have not got to where I wanted to, but I've got to where the Holy Spirit wanted me to go to. And so I'm going to have to conclude this service. And I want to speak to those of you that have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. See, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was lost because of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Through one man's transgression, death, spiritual death, separation from the life of God, passed upon every man, woman, boy, and girl that is born into this world by a man and a woman. Every person who's born into this world is born with what's called the endemic nature. You didn't choose to be born that way, but nevertheless, you were born that way because of the first man, Adam and Eve. But God didn't leave you without any hope. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be born of the Virgin Mary. It was a holy birth. It was a divine birth. He was not born with the same nature of Adam and Eve. So when he was born, he was born as the son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. So he said, I come, he says, I have come. He says, the son of man cometh to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's why he came and allowed himself to be crucified on the cross. The Bible says in the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, it says, God commended his love through, uh, to us, uh, through us, uh, <clears throat> God commended his love to us by, um, God commended his love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Praise God. In other words, while, we, while you are a sinner now, Jesus already died for you and paid the price so that you can become born again. He became sin who knew no sin, that you might become the righteous of God in Christ. That's why we're righteous. That's why we're born again, because of what Jesus Christ did. Now, the Bible says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave he power or the right to become sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. Romans 10, 9 and 10 said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, he said you will be saved. For with your heart you believe unto righteousness and with your mouth confession is made unto salvation. You go from here, from here to over here. Here is salvation. Here you are without salvation. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth unto salvation. I want to lead you into prayer. I want you to pray this prayer with me, not just to ape and imitate me, but pray because you believe it in your heart. Because the Bible says, with your heart you believe unto, and with your mouth confession is made unto salvation. The confession that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died, was crucified on the cross, died, was buried, and on the third day he was raised from the dead so you can be saved. You say that to God because you believe in your heart, and God will give you eternal life. You will become born again. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one moving around, no one looking around, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And you're bowing your heads and closing your eyes as if no spiritual significance only enables you to concentrate on God and Him alone because that's where your hope is coming from. If there's a Christian sitting next to you, that believer, I'm asking you to pray along with that person that is need to be born again so you can encourage them. We're going to pray out loud here to encourage you so that you can become born again. So say these words with me now. Say, Dear God, I come to you now. Just as I am a sinner, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, that he came to the earth and was crucified on the cross for sin, that he died and was buried in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And I believe on the third day that you raised Jesus from the dead so I could be saved. I accept what Jesus Christ did for me. I accept him now as my Lord and my Savior. And because I believe this in my heart and I've confessed with my mouth, I am now saved. I am born again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for saving me. Amen.
Amen. Praise the Lord. The reason why we're clapping here enthusiastically here at Abiding Faith Christian Center as well as others that are watching is because the Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one sinner who has repented, who has turned from darkness to light. So they're having a party up in heaven for you right now. So we are party crashers. We crash the party. We're rejoicing and excited about you now being born into our family, the family of God. You're a brother, you're a sister right now. And we want to give you a free gift for your new birth. It's called The New Birth. This book here is free. All you got to do is call, call us at the telephone number at the end of this broadcast. It'll be on the screen. That telephone number is going to be 810-515-1286. In fact, if you call that telephone number now, then we can get your name, your address, and we can send you this book as well as information about Abiding Faith Christian Center so that you can come down and join our church and become a member so you can come under the shepherd that's going to feed you the word of God so that you can grow and become conformed to the image of God's dear son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers praise God and if you're somewhere else in the geographical United States of America call and we'll find a church home we'll look it up for you and refer you to some places or pray with you so that you can find a good church home because we're sure that God has some place there for you if not you can continue watching us on the program every Sunday every Thursday and join us in prayer on every Saturday well, praise the Lord. I want to remind you that, uh, well, praise God. I want to remind you that John, the 15th chapter, verse number 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. God bless you and we'll see you real soon. Amen.